everybody. Good afternoon, early evening. It's Michelle Lee, the host of the Bluegrass Borderline, the Smoke Country Jam. It's Real Talk Bluegrass and Unbelievable, episode four. And we've been having so much fun doing these uh, wonderful bi-weekly uh, Real Talk Bluegrass. And today, of course, two amazing songwriters joining us. First, uh, singer, uh, singer-songwriter uh, Daryl Mosley, as well as songwriter-producer Louisa Branscombe. Um, she is a recipient of the 2017 Distinguished uh, Achievement Award from the International Bluegrass Music Association. So let the fun begin and get real here on Real Talk Bluegrass today. Well, welcome, everybody. Hey. Thank you, Michelle. Well, it's great to have both of you here with us today. Um, I hope you guys are having wonderful weather where you're at. Uh, I know the weather's been kind of a little sticky and hot and humid everywhere, but uh, for the most part, this has got to be a great feel to uh, get together and talk with fellow songwriters about some great bluegrass and get a little real, right? Yeah, this will be yeah. fun. So, um, first and foremost, uh, Louisa, you know, this is a, this is a great honor once again to have you be part of an event that I'm doing and, and having someone with your history of songwriting. You've had numerous uh, achievements in your career um, with not only the International Bluegrass Music Association, but the Grammys. Um, what can one uh, aspire to when looking at what you've done in your career, you feel? Uh, as what can somebody aspire to as a songwriter in themselves? Yes. Okay. Um, the truth. The truth. Nice. <laughs> I love it. I love it. The realness. And Daryl, of course, you've uh, won, won uh, Songwriter of the Year with Spigma. And, you know, as a songwriter for you, uh, how can you inspire um, others to kind of like take something from what you've done and bring it out of the forefront for them as well. Looks like we lost him. He should be back uh, at any time, and I'll bring him back in. Okay, okay. Well, Louisa, how about you answering that question? Well, I was just going to follow up and say what I meant by the truth, I think, when you're writing a song. And, and this whole situation that we're all in is kind of like undressing us as artists. Mm -hmm. And that helps us get closer to the truth. It's just not always comfortable to figure out what am I really trying to say here? So that's kind of to, to flesh that out a little bit. Right, right. Well, and you know, during this time, obviously uh, the pandemic folks, obviously, uh, going towards more songs, uh, listening to music more, um, giving, getting some inspiration, not only as, you know, artists themselves, but everyday people who are working, you know, trying to maintain a sense of normalcy. Um, how do you feel like as a songwriter, songs that you've written or songs that you hear from your co-writers or other uh, songwriters kind of could lead the way for others to, you know, wrap the normalcy around that? I think that um, if if ever there was a time that we give ourselves permission to be creative and um, and and write, you know, and be creative in your life, no matter what it is, that this is the time because mm -hmm. there's so much we can't do anything about, and it's depressing. And uh, you know, we're going through a lot of grieving, um, a lot of groping, um, trying to find answers to sort of how to get by and the thing you can depend on songs for is if you sit to write one and if you really engage in going as deep as you can to what the real message is then it transforms you in some small way and and of course having said that I've been in traumatic situations where I was too frozen to write uh -huh. but by the same token, by the same token, if you dedicate yourself to staying connected to yourself, you will see the hooks come along. You know, um, you'll you'll see the important things happen in your life, and you go, "That could be a song title." And then, when you begin a song, by the time you get to the end, you've changed, and uh, there's a transformation. And and just the act of writing that song is, I don't want to say, I hate that, you know, healing word, no, 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 but. But it does change you. And I think so you asked about what can people take from the world of songwriting. And I think it's permission um, 
and maybe the goal doesn't have to be the perfect song or get recorded or dance on Broadway. You know, maybe the goal is figure out what I really need to say and put it in about six words or less. In this moment, about maybe one thing I'm thinking or feeling, that's a song title. That's right. all you have to do. And when you do that, you really do um, dive down to the deep end. So that's um, maybe one way to answer that. I've lost <laughs> is Daryl here. <laughs> I, I think we I think we're still waiting for Daryl to get back in. Okay. <laughs> but um, you know, on that, you, you you obviously, you know, we're all going through um the same pandemic and but also different feelings from everybody. I mean, I have friends who are like, oh, I just don't know. My my mind and my head is just doesn't feel like I'm there enough for my son or there enough for my parents. And it's like, but you have to be there for you first before you can be good for anybody. And if that draws you to music to inspire you to, you know, take the lyrics from someone else who has written them to be that person, I think that's where the love of music, you know, involves all around, whether it's, you know, no matter what genre of music it is. And oh, uh, oh, yeah. I totally get it. I mean, I think what you're saying is like, we we just need a peg to hang our hat on. And if mm -hmm. that is hearing someone else's song, um, I think it is just um, staying in the game sometimes. Right. You know? uh, staying in the game, you know, and let music be one of the things that helps you stay in the game. Um, maybe let songs, the words of songs. I mean, it's here is the thing. I think that it's there's no time like the present to take songwriting more seriously and songwriters more seriously because in a time of crisis, you need your artists. Right. And we, and we, because of live media and, uh, you know, we can get, we can get our songs out immediately. I mean, I could start singing right now, but I'm not, <laughs> don't worry. <laughs> but I mean, you know, the, the, at least social media is allowing us to stay connected. It also allows us to put our creativity out there. And, um, Do you feel like right now it's it, this is basically a good where everybody is kind of rediscovering themselves um, to, you know, knowing their true self, whether it's, you know, personally or professionally? It's looking like we might we, we might have some, some difficulties today. I think so. Well, I know Daryl said he, they were having um, possibly some storms coming in um, and that. So, but I think we, uh, <laughs> we are, we've lost Louisa. <laughs> I think so. She hasn't left yeah. the room yet. Um, You're right. I'm going to remove her and then we can chat for a little bit. And if I see her moving around, I'll bring her back in. Okay. That's cool. Oh, so, no, I, <laughs> uh, so yeah, you know, I, this is going to be a fun day. <laughs> You get me, and that's dangerous. <laughs> that's <the only laughs> well, okay, Sammy. I mean, you're, you're a record executive. You know, you, you run Six One Five Hideaway Records. You know, you've got new artists, new uh, music coming out. Yep, Daryl just said power outage uh, uh, down there in Nashville. So, um, all right, that's good to know. Um, but uh, the um, the effects, you know, of music and the music that is being released now. I know you have an album that was just released with Nick uh, Chandler and delivered. You know, how do, how does that change for you guys um, and how you guys are presenting the music now without a tour? Yeah, so on where we're we're sitting right now, you have the label side and then you have the artist side, and they're they're separate. Um, mm -hmm. you know, the way we make our money and the way the artists make their money are, are two completely different things. So the artists are on the road, they're selling product, they're selling merch, um, you know, they're, they're driving their, their CD sales. Um, and on the label side, we're trying to promote and get streaming and, and, and downloads. Um, and, and then of course, um, you know, the other monetization as far as YouTube goes, Facebook goes, uh, Instagram is not really doing monetization for us right now, um, but it's affected, you know, both of us because the artists aren't, aren't on the road out there making money, um, you know, uh, selling product. Um, so it's, it's tough. So we have to go, go and 
try to figure out how do we do it online? You know, how, how do we get somebody to get excited about buying a CD or buying, buying some merch online? And I'm seeing a lot of artists that are doing a good job with it. And I'm also seeing a lot of artists, top artists that are not doing a very good job with it. Right. They're struggling. They're struggling. Yeah, exactly. I mean, I think that's uh, something that, you know, I see a lot of fans interact on Facebook, social media, Instagram and, and things like that. I think, you know, the ones who can support, they're doing what they can to support artists. Um, and I, I love the fact like the SOS, you know, obviously doing their online shows this coming weekend, um, tomorrow and Saturday, what, I believe it's what, $5 to watch the, for each day um, for the, the event, if I'm the not ticket. mistaken. Yeah. For, yeah. for tickets. So, I mean, that's something, you know, where, you know, you're, you're still having the entertainment and, you know, it, it, it's great fun to be able to break away from your everyday scheduling, you know, and, and just relax and watch, watch a show. Granted, you'd rather be there in person, but. Oh, Louise is back. Louise, she's better, right. she's better than, than, than me. I mean, I'm going to bring her back in. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> There you go. We're back. Oh, there we are. <laughs> so, um, Louisa, I was kind of um, my question before we, we got froze there for a moment. Um, you know, this is kind of like a way for everybody to kind of rediscover themselves, too, is uh, during this time. And how have you personally kind of rediscovered you as a songwriter, a musician and, you know, an everyday lady of, you know, fun and and everything. <laughs> I mean, it's a great question. And uh, sometimes I think I'm just, you know, um, hanging on like a tiger by the tail to what, whatever's going on right now. But um, I think the first thing that I did is, is really have a reckoning mm -hmm. that um, we're entering a time of, of te testing ourselves. Um, and and I'm not even talking professionally or financially or politically. I'm just talking about fr in terms of where your heart is and where your head is about what's important. And I think the virus is like, it's, it's like, or the situation is like a mirror and it gives us a chance to look in the mirror and say, well, you know, who am I? And who I am is exactly how I'm acting. That's who I am. It's whatever I'm doing. Right. And so it, it kind of gives, it's kind of like uh, whether we like it or not, an opportunity to have a reckoning. And anytime there's a crisis, um, you know, we have an initial, initial response of being angry or defended, but if we can get beyond that, and I'm just saying this is also an, it's something I aspire to, not easy, um, if we can get beyond that resistance to some level of acceptance, it kind of takes us to a new level of vulnerability. And I think when, the only way to really get close to um, maybe your soul or, or what's really going on with you with you is as a human being, you know, in, the, in terms of humanity, is to get to that vulnerability. Mm -hmm. And that vulnerability is exactly where we write or be creative from. It might be your questions. It might be someone else's conversation with uh, their partner. It might be writing a, a song or it might be I'm um, doing a painting. And so I, I've, I know that I've said in my workshops that empathy is the essential tool of songwriting. And so it's a hard time to remember to have empathy for ourselves. We're grieving mm -hmm. so much. And I think it's a tendency to get angry. How come I'm not doing better? Why right. am I, you know, it's my fault that I'm not, you know, doing more to connect with my friends online or, and, and it's easy to beat up on yourself. And it's easy to beat up on each other. <laughs> And, oh, yeah. and, and, you know, so I, I think that it's a chance for the culture and maybe individuals, we're not used to being vulnerable, you know, and one thing that I, I find hard is I'm, cause I'm a very private person is doing things like this. And yet by being vulnerable and that is how we can connect and, and, um, feel like we all are all part of something. I mean, I just uh, had a song recorded called we're all just walking each other home it's a proverb and it's uh, not, those aren't my words, but it's um, the idea that we all, we all are in this together. We really mm -hmm. are. And so, right. and there, and there's a process of, you know, we go through like, like, you know, you've heard people talk about, well, when someone dies and you know, you agree the process five stages of grief, but 
cultures do that too. And when I stand back and look at America, you know, it's like, and, and there's stages and the stages are, you'll get a kick out of this. It's like um, griping, groping, grieving, um, <laughs> Uh, grouping and grace. So griping, I think we're kind of in the griping stage, like we're angry about this, we don't want to accept it. And then uh, groping is when you kind of move along a little, you're looking for answers and trying this, trying that. Um, grieving is just the the challenge of feeling the sadness of all that we've lost. And, and we may never get some of that back. That's right. why we're all fearing underneath, right? And then grouping is the next stage. And that's like we come together to solve the problems. And, and that shows that you're really moving through a crisis. And, and then grace, you know, is that for me, that's the idea of, um, you know, we can relax again. We've found a solution. We've risen, risen to a higher plane of acceptance and creativity and doing it differently, you know? So, so you know, I what you what i uh, my thought uh it's coming back to me sorry <laughs> um so this is unique because like everything you've just touched on is you know obviously everything we've watched happen in the news i don't want to get too much into all the you know the details on that but yeah. Yeah, it, it's hard it. not to it's hard not to because of you know watching everything that has happened and you know every state is you know trying to be be together and work as one and get over this uh, pandemic, bring those numbers down. But at the same time, you see those other states, there's states that keep on going up and Ohio's one of them, you know, we're not far behind, you know, mm -hmm. and Texas and Arizona and the Carolinas, um, you know, it's kind of, uh, uh, you know, just one of those things where it's like, you're grasping, like, what can you do? And, you know, all I can say is what our governor said yesterday, you know, wear a mask you know you might not think it's helping or you just refuse to but also at the same time think about the businesses who are trying to help you you know maintain and keep your essential products in in the home and and everything allow you to come in the store and if you don't have that mask on they have the right to not serve you like if you don't have a shirt or shoes on you know it's mm -hmm. like right now mm -hmm. just obey that you know and you like you said we will get through this together right now we're getting through this and yeah, we just need and to Without, visit that. without getting into the whole mask issue, because I'm I just like to sail over the, you know, at least in my public <laughs> um, forums is, you know, it it's hard to be vulnerable. It's hard mm -hmm. to talk about caring about the other person if something offends us. And, and and I don't mean and I mean either side of the fence. And so I think where that what that comes down to for artists is you can write a song about any piece of this. And maybe you write the griping song, you know, the griping, groping, groping grieving, grouping. You know, maybe, uh -huh. maybe you're in a, a, maybe your day is a griping day. You can write that song. Maybe your day is a grieving song, is a grieving day. Then you can mm -hmm. write a song about grieving. They're all truths and they're all truths that lots of people are feeling. And, you know, I, I just think that one of, one of the most extraordinary profound things that has happened to me as a songwriter was, was the moment I realized that I could write a silly little song about my life and have it connect with someone on the other side of the world. Right. And, and it happened when I was at Buddy's Barbecue in 1974 and a, a, a woman came up and she just started talking to me and I was like trying to get off the stage because I was really shy, but she's going to talk to me anyway. And and she said, I know what that song is about. I think it was Steel Rails. And, it, you know, and she told me like a long life story. It wasn't at all what I meant the song to be about. And, <laughs> and yeah, but, you know, and then I had the, the, the good sense to realize that in that moment, it doesn't matter if that's what I wrote it about. Right. And the situation that's happening around us means we all have all of these things in common. So art the thing that pulls the thread is more important than ever. It's just hard for us as artists to keep our chin up, I think, and keep, you know, that made me a little choked up there and, and keep creating. And we, we don't, we get to have days we don't create. You right. Know? I mean, I've, as you know, I've been in the wilderness for three days where I didn't even have a computer or cell service and I couldn't watch Netflix all night. And, and, you know, it was a real cleansing. And mm -hmm. I think that, 
that you know we can do that. You you said earlier, what do we do for ourselves? Maybe we need more time to really um, shed off the layers of all this and get back to just our essential selves and our essential worth. Mm -hmm. and, oh know, yeah. Like start over at the bottom, and we may have to kind of start over at the bottom a lot. You know, like a like a car and the battery is just you know you just got to sort of start it back up. <laughs> and, right. And um, so I guess what I'm saying is the world is so we're all so close to each other in an ironic way, yet we're so isolated and lonely. And song songs can bridge that, whether it means writing something that happened to you or whether it means list, you know, pull up. If you're if you want to get into your the darkness of your soul, pull up Leonard Cohen. If you want to get into the politics, pull up Bob Dylan. Right. You, uh, if you if you want to be happy. Listen to Barefoot Girl. <laughs> still on the charts after ten months or nine months, right? Um, and so I think that means people want to be happy. And Woody Guthrie said the world needs more happy songs, and my mom did too. And you know, unfortunately, she died before I wrote Barefoot Girl. But anyway, but it's an awesome song. It, by the way, is on your brand new album, um, yes. Compass Records. Gonna yeah. love anyway. Um, so yeah, that it, the album itself is spectacular, and of course, we're going to touch base a little bit on that here in just a bit. But I want to let everybody know, uh, Daryl Mosley, of course, should be joining us. Um, he has had power outage, so it's uh, me and Louisa right now. Hope y'all, um, if you have questions, let us know. Um, I'll be happy to, uh, you know, uh, ask away as uh, I do each and every episode, and of course, episode four to this week, uh, with Louisa Branscombe, and of course, Daryl Mosley when we are able to get him back on um and of course who knows you know today is that day you just don't know what the storms are going to happen uh, as they keep calling because they've been calling for storms in ohio for weeks now and we had a little bit this morning nothing else yet today so kind of keeps going over but it looks like nashville is getting a little bit of it so uh uh but you know one of the things um you know when you you, you talk about uh this pandemic and songwriting and you think about relationships and you tie them in um together as a songwriter or even as you know you and you know your relationship with your your wonderful dog or you know or another family member or uh and you know look at her just enjoying the day i love it <laughs> or, or the horses i mean how how can you know those relationships you know, evolve out of something like this, um, whether it's through song or just in, you know, everyday life? It's, I, you know, that's a great question. And I, I'd like to hear everybody's answer to that. <laughs> but, but I think it's the same thing. I think that, you know, I think we can either come in life and in relationships from a place of fighting and toughness or from the place of, of um, allowing ourselves to be vulnerable and really hear each other, you know, and, right. and that's empathy. And so if we could just get beyond politics and just get beyond, um, you know, we, we, we get to keep griping, you know, the griping, groping, grieving, but we get to keep griping. But it's also nice to have some of those other stages of trauma. You know, I've been a trauma psychologist for about 40 years. So I've been thinking about, and I've worked with a lot of veterans and um, a lot with natural disaster. And mm -hmm. this is everything all in one crisis. So I've been thinking a lot about um, how do we use crisis to pull out something good? And, uh, and that's one way I think we can, because, you can only be tough so long. And if we just right. look at the at, at the relationship like you're talking uh, from the standpoint of a deeper connection, it's just harder right now because we're all stressed. It's harder to let down the fighting defenses and the, and the um, self-protective defenses. And what's important as far as songwriting, that's the same process that you do when you write a song. It's exactly right. the same process. So I guess, and I don't know, I'm kind of clumsy here, but but it is the same thing as when you go in a songwriting workshop, what in my workshops we real usually do is try to shed some of the layers of what's happening out there in the world and in our jobs and in you know, the clutter mm -hmm. and, and, and descend sort of, descend down into what is really going on with me right now? You know, do I have tears? Do I have hope? Do I have, 
and just writing or being what that is and communicating what that is. So anytime both people can be vulnerable, there is the chance of a deeper connection. But the more right. shields, the more shields you have up, the less you can be connected. And sometimes I just, sometimes I, I get sad because I'm like, well, you know, these situations, masks and this and that, couldn't we just see it in terms of humanity? Couldn't, couldn't we just see it in the, in the ways we're the same? We don't want to die. Nobody wants to die. No. Like them or not like them. Nobody. I don't think most people want to die or uh, hopefully they, if they do momentarily, they, you know, it's only temporary um, because we're all part of humanity. And that's, you know, that's the song going to love anyway, going to live anyway. It's, it's that song. Um, uh -huh. And uh, so. How did so, that song come about for you? Gonna love so, anyway. So gonna love anyway uh, is the title song of of the last album, as you know. And um, it the timing of writing it um, came from I had just come out of of a natural disaster. This is an international <laughs> disaster, but it was a a tornado that hit my farm, and I was looking for some kind of redemption. And that is, you know, it's it's the it's the age old human journey. Uh, you know, the, the story of the human journey, which is you go through these times mm -hmm. and, and the, and so you're, you're down at the bottom of the dark night of the soul. If you want to hear about those songs, listen to Leonard Cohen, but, um, and you're looking for some way to solve how bad you feel some way out and, and all of the things you've done before, maybe it was go party. Maybe it was drink. Maybe it was um, go meet with friends, you know, they aren't working anymore. And then, and, and I was in one of those moments and I was sitting at the top of the hill at my farm and I looked up and I saw this pine tree that had been stripped of its branches. And, um, and I thought, you know, what, what can redeem this? You know, what can redeem this situation? And, and I got to say, I don't know how to have a big enough heart or soul to, to adequately, re, you know, put redemption into a song right now, but I'm going to try. And, and the, the gun to love anyway is if that was, that was that I thought about that time I was in Colorado when I was 12, my dad and, and um, kicked over a rock on, and the rock was on a glacier and underneath is this little blue flower. And it just said, God, God live anyway. Uh -huh. and, uh, and, and so that's what the song's about. And so that's, you know, we're stuck. I mean, guess what? Here's the headline. We're alive. This is happening. Right. Now, right. the <laughs> you know, <laughs> and, and, and so that's, that's the headline we all share. So, so let's get on with it. I mean, and, and that's just a, that's a little, any little thing counts. I mean, if I told myself I got to write a song about this, you know, I'd probably freak myself out, but I will try. <laughs> and I have. <laughs> well, and, and, and this kind of comes to one of my uh, questions about renew um, and how how do you recover after uh, a failure or a loss, whether it's a, your professional life or, you know, personal life? Um, how do you kind of uh, invent that and renew that into what you, you want to move forward with? You, you know, you're asking some real tough questions and, and they're good questions. <laughs> So um, <laughs> let me think, how do we renew? Um, I, I think the first part of that we've been kind of hitting on, which is uh -huh. acceptance of what is, you know, mm -hmm. it, because if, so acceptance of what is, then you realize, like for me, I realize I am so tired. I'm tired of, um, you know, I'm tired at some kind of emotional level of reading the stuff and I don't even have a TV. So it's just on Facebook. and. Um, and so recognizing where you're at and then listen to what you need. And that's really hard sometimes. And I think just to do that, you got to have a quiet space and, and stop and think, okay, what do I really need? Well, I really need to connect with someone, you know, and then uh -huh. do the best you can, or I really need to rest, or I really need to go out on a hillside somewhere. And, you know, that's part of my spirituality is, is nature and nature is everywhere. And nature just, and, you know, I just wrote a song with Ray Cardwell and, and, and it was called Rising Sun. But we were talking about and he's released that, by the way, it's uh, it's out yeah. now. So he's it's the first song released on his new album. And and um, and, and we of course, we had to do it from a distance because of COVID. 
Actually, right. I don't even know if I've adequately even met Ray in person, but um, we're talking about the world outside your window is still there. If you just for a minute can even just get in a space of, of uh, separating from all of the hard stuff going on and, and just say, I can go sit under a tree like I always have. There's mm -hmm. so much life force in nature. So I've been out at Mount Rogers and camping and, um, and, and everything's blooming, you know, and everything's still going and, and, and nature will, will renew. So I, what's renewal for me might be different from what is for you. Right. Of course. Of course. And so, wow, there's Daryl. Welcome back. Power's back on, huh? <laughs> Just as we started this clap of thunder and then everything went black. So, of course, what uh, well, else would you expect out of 2020, right? right? <laughs> so true. So true. Well, so obviously we're talking about different, uh, uh, obviously uh, different uh, ways to kind of renew and re uh, rediscover the, uh, the, the way people, you write into the, how folks are, you know, coming to music right during this time. Um, but I, so here's, here's another one as we discover, rediscover, um, is there a time and Daryl, I hope I want you to answer this one first, if you don't mind. Um, has there been a time that someone has helped you find, um, a, a little bit clarity and, um, that has helped you in your direction of what you do as a songwriter and as a as a person and how can you help others do the same are you talking about during this pandemic or are you talking about in general in general um yeah this is a story i've told a, a bunch because it made such a huge impact with me when i was a young songwriter i'm really starting to try to figure it out i was probably 19 or 20 and I became acquainted with a guy in Nashville named Larry Shell. And Larry was a great country songwriter, had lots of hit records. And, um, but Larry just opened up his door to me and allowed me to, whenever I wanted to come in and sit in his office and play him songs. And he would tell me what works and what didn't work and why it didn't work. And, and when something, you know, was, was good or almost there. And, and, you know, and it was, and of course he never made a dime off of me. There was, there was nothing in it for him other than the fact that he was, he was further down the road as a writer, much further than I was and, and took it out of his, the, just the goodness of his heart to open up to me. And I will never forget what I learned just sitting in his office and having those conversations and playing him songs. And so one thing that I've always tried to do now that I've had 30 plus years of actually having a little bit of success at this is to be the same kind of guy. And to, you know, to whenever new writers or young writers have questions or want to want to talk or want to play something to try to listen and try to encourage because I know what a huge impact that made for me. Right. Now, uh, is there a, uh, yes, Sammy, I, don't know. I can I'm, hear you. <laughs> <laughs> I'm still, I'm still here, I think. <laughs> oh, that's too funny. Oh, uh, today is one of those days. You definitely know it's 2020, right? <laughs> indeed, indeed. <laughs> well, I had, I, I also just asked Louisa as you were joining in, um, <clears throat> you know, uh, about uh, uh, something that kind of like renewing and kind of rediscover a, a failure or a loss. How do you renew from one or the other uh, as you, you know, become creative in your songwriting or in your personal life as well you know writing can be therapeutic and at least it can for me you know i know that you know i, I wrote a couple of songs uh that i ended up recording uh after after my dad passed away you know songs that were difficult to to sing and still are difficult to sing um but it allowed me to to kind of to deal with those emotions. And that's to me, one of the greatest gifts of, of creativity is that you've got a place to put that stuff. You know, it, it would be hard for me to, to not have some kind of outlet uh, to express that. And, and so, and, and it obviously doesn't have to be music. You know, there's lots of other, you know, uh, avenues for that. But for me, writing songs and, and, and getting that out has, has been a huge help, you know, and just processing. You know, right. Yeah. Building on that, I uh, like what you said there. Sometimes, it, sometimes when the when the chips are falling, it's hard to be creative, 
And the challenge is allowing yourself to stay, stay suspended in the not knowing until you get uh, what it is you need to say. And I think that's so the hardest thing. And we tend to beat ourselves up as people and as songwriters, you know, I can't find the answer right now, but as creative people, like I, I was, I have twice in the last two years been told by the medical profession that my days were limited. Um, two different situations, a totally unrelated. And I had to go through that proverbial two to four weeks of hell. And yeah. so my go-to place was the first time, I mean, I was clueless because I just, you know, I'm pretty much take my health for granted. And, uh, you know, I mean, I drive a tractor, how sick could I be, right? You know, I haul, I haul buckets. And um, I thought, well, this will just be a piece of cake. I'll just write a song. Cause you know, if you can write a song, you move through something from the beginning of the song to the end and the yeah. beginning of writing it to the end. You cannot be the same person at the end of the song as you were when you started the song. The problem was for the first time in my life, I really couldn't get any words for a song. I, I, and I've been writing since I was five. When I was little, it was so much more comfortable to me to write than it was to talk to people. <laughs> and, you know, and, and um, it's really more like, more like my go-to place. So when I couldn't write a song, that was totally more scary than my might die, right? <laughs> and so I just kind of, I told myself, okay, what do you tell your students? And it was like, okay, well, just hang in and wait. Stay with it. Don't try to deny it. Plow through it. Throw a glass against the wall. You know, just stay with it. And, and, and then the song came out, which is called The Hand of Time. And it starts out, the hand of time's got a grip around my neck. And I think it's going to bring me down. Uh, got a reason it won't, got a reason, got a feeling it won't do no good to beg. And I don't beg anyhow. And the song um, certainly was the most powerful one I've written to me. And um, probably going to record it soon. And, and so, you know, it did eventually come, you know, being able to write. And, and what I learn and you learn, do you find Daryl, you learn about yourself from your own song? That's what I mean about if you can get to the truth and try to say it, the song will write you. It will tell you what, what is important. It will tell you who you are. It will tell you what's going on with you. And sometimes I don't even know how I write them, but then I, I look at them and I'm like, Oh crap. Oh, well, you know, that's something I need to hear right now because I let myself listen to something that maybe is in me, but I think goes through me beyond me like a rabbit hole. And, I totally and, get that. And, I think and, a lot of, a, a lot of writers would, would tell you that. And it, people ask me, how do you write songs? And I tell you, I have no idea. I mean, it's really hard to explain that. I mean, you can explain the craft part of it, but but when when the lyrics and the melodies and that stuff just starts churning and starts building and starts coming out, it's hard to really explain how that process happens. Yeah. And so you're right. I think sometimes you can, out of your subconscious, you'll pick up on things later when you see it written down that maybe you didn't know were there before. And and if you really do um, pull back the curtains of the heart, as a poet named Rilke said, if you really pull back the curtains on your own soul. You, you don't you we usually often don't like what we see there you know because his metaphor is the furniture is in disarray who who among us wants to pull back the curtains and and because you know and see that the furniture is in disarray well now more than ever let's just face it i mean the furniture is in disarray we are all not at our best but we also have our shining moments so what you're saying it, there's a certain amount of how do you put it into words but um i i do think it involves pulling back the curtains and sitting with what is and maybe getting some pictures of, of what uh, what the images are that capture what's going on with you. Maybe it's uh, maybe it's putting it in a few words. Maybe it's um, a story that fits with what you're feeling. It doesn't matter. Just write it, write it on a page. And if you want to make it into a song, uh, pick five words. That's the title and pick three, you know, what was happening at the beginning of this thing you want to say, what was happening in the middle, and what happened, and then what what's the takeaway? And that's three verses, and thank God we're in a genre of it. <laughs> three verses and a chorus, you guys. Um, and and uh, so I think it involves that um, something about 
the learn it's always a work in progress for me to to practice that thing of of um pulling back my own curtains and kind of seeing what's really going on because a lot of times it's sadness or it might be fear or it might be fury but whatever that is is the song so when you write it it's the thing that you needed to hear and and you know it's just you have to trust it's also what somebody else might want to hear <laughs> <laughs> Well, you know, the, with that, I have to ask, you know, as you, you think about songwriting, like you said, and writing it where, you know, you can kind of see yourself in that. So it, it's like a sense of belonging. And how do you maintain it um, from songs and melodies, the lyrics uh, daily? Because, I mean, you know, as songwriters, this is this is what you do. This is your craft. You're always uh, you're always at the, um, you know, at the. Um, the canvas of your paper and creating. So how do you, how do you maintain that um, as you go forward every day? Maintain sort of being creative and, and keeping Be, songs happening. Is yeah. And the sense of belonging. Yeah. The sense of belonging. Huh? Uh, I want to make sure I understand your question. The sense of belonging as a songwriter or it's yeah, a, it's a, it's a, uh, bringing in like your own self into the songs and feeling belonging and how you maintain it um, and bringing it to the craft. It, you know, I think I think what people forget is that the in between the writing is part of songwriting. The in between. So so the task is because that's when stuff's happening. We're digesting. We're waiting for the hook. We're waiting for when the light is going to hit that tree at a certain time today. It's going to remind me of something I feel. So, you know, we're waiting and the waiting is part of the song. So if you have fewer songs, I try to forgive myself and say, I'm waiting. I'm in between. The trick is it doesn't do any good to be in between if you aren't also open enough to what's going on with yourself or, or images and things around you or like something that happened, like maybe you'll say something today and it makes me feel a certain way. And then I think, oh, there's an image that fits that, you know, it's when I was walking by the creek yesterday or something. And mm -hmm. um, so I don't know if that's makes sense, but do you think that Daryl, you know, like the, the waiting, the in between, it's like, it's the hardest part because you have to stay in the game and realize that unconsciously things are happening if we let them. You know, I think it's important to kind of keep your radar up, you know, for for the ideas and things. But, you know, Bill Gaither said something to me a few years ago about, a, you know, a song that I wrote. And he said, you know, one of these days that song will outlive you. And that's the first time I've really thought about the fact that the body of work that we're creating will likely still be here once we're gone. And so it made me to be a lot more conscious of the body of work that I'm creating. Because I, not only do I want the songs to be good songs, but I want them to represent the legacy I want to leave behind. You know, I want the songs to be songs that that are a reflection of my my beliefs and my faith and my morals and my and my ideas. You know, and so I try really hard to make sure that I I don't necessarily restrict what I write, but but I have certain things that I that I that I will push away or that I'll pull closer to me when I am writing in order to, to make that part of the package. So uh, here's another, another question is, uh, is there an idea of a song that you've uh, both have, you know, kind of shelved, um, but you are, you know, you think about it and you're like, Hmm, it's time to pursue it. Let's, let's create this, this, uh, you know, topic this song this title whether you know because you know like you said you could have a title you could have a hook line it could be something but you might not have anything else at that time so when do you decide daryl to like revisit that and say it's time to pursue and discover that and create it you know most of the time when that's happened with me the the song kind of finds its own way and because I, I don't have a lot of bits and pieces of songs that I've been working on for a long period of time, but it does happen. Um, years ago, when I was on the road with, with New Tradition, uh, I was working on this song called Honest Man, a song that I never wrote. And it was about, you know, the, the first verse was about this little boy who, 
stole some candy and had to return it to the store. And Danny Roberts used to love this song. You know, we, we talked about finishing it. We never did. And then I had this other idea for a song uh, called I Would that was a, basically a, you know, a guy's going to be faithful to his girl kind of song. Um, and never finished that song either. But, but years later, those two songs came together and became this song called I Would that turned out to be a gospel song, turned out to be a number one song in Southern Gospel. That had, I had no idea that's where that song was going to end up. Mm-hmm. Both of the ideas were strong, but bringing those two together was way stronger. That was not planned. That just kind of evolved over the years of still playing with those lines and playing with those melodies, and it just kind of turned into that. I don't fully understand how that happens. I just know that it does. And I think trying to stay focused as a songwriter and thinking like a songwriter, uh, like Louise is talking about during those in-between times, that's when those things take place, for me anyway. I love that answer, Daryl. Um, and I love that, you know, that you know you have to love, ah, this is even hard to say, you have to love your ideas enough to keep them alive and file them away. Yeah. Like, but, it, you know, that I've been preaching a lot about honesty to your what's going on with you. So I guess I'll have to answer that question, honestly, which is, yeah, <laughs> I got one. And that is that I think there's that I am probably going to have to write because, because I, it's an ethical thing, which is I, one time I was driving through Birmingham. I'm from Birmingham, Alabama. I grew up during the civil rights movement and I um, have wrestled with that a lot all my life, you know, shame around that and, and my own identity. And you know, we have a, a huge important thing happening right now with Black Lives Matter. And I, I um, this, this line has been haunting me that when I was on the road at one point, uh, probably I was about 30 and we went, we were driving through Birmingham and it was late at night. So I didn't stop and, and see my parents. Um, we had to drive through and we went through downtown Birmingham and the line is, as I drive past ghosts and angels on the streets of Birmingham. And it, and it gives me kind of chills to say that because it's a, it's a hard thing for me to reckon with, um, you know, what's, what's my part and how do I write, how do I write a song that does justice to um, what's going on right now with that? And, and, and I, you know, then this other part of me, the songwriter teacher says, just write what you write, you know, and, and tell your personal experience. And if you're honest to it, and, and if you have humanity at the heart of it, it will be the right song. Um, if I try to write a song that accurately tells the story about, you know, is my vote about um, what I think about the movement that I grew up during, you know, I probably would scare myself to death. But if I talk about what that was like to drive through Birmingham and the streets were empty and dark. And I got so much from my home state. Oh my gosh, Alabama has given me so much and still does and creativity and understanding the dark side and the light side, you know, the beauty as well as the the, heart, the river of darkness, you know, the church bombing. I mean, and so I've reckoned with that all my, all my life. It's probably a defining thing about me is my, my, uh, my history. I think our, our histories really have a huge amount to do with who we are as artists, you know, and I need to write that song and I'm just going to have to tell myself, you have a month to write that song. And, and it, and, you know, and, and, um, but for me, it was ghosts and angels. It's like the, the beauty and yet the, the tragedy, you know, that happened on those very streets, mm-hmm. those very streets. And, um, that, there are so much, you know, defining for me. And so not you, turning away, not turning away is the whole thing, not turning away. Do you, I'm going to kind of ask you this question because the fact that you're talking about ghosts and angels and do you think there's a, there's a, there's a message that they're trying to give you to write? You want to, <laughs> I mean, I definitely. You asking me? Yeah. I, <laughs> I don't know. I mean, I guess I have a different approach to it. You know, I, I was born and raised in the South, and I'm very proud of the of the 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 people here. My my you know my father, my mother's still alive. My father's passed, but his his parents, their parents, their parents, many generations are you know are are Southerners and from Tennessee, and 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 so I'm really proud of of, of our history here. And 
And and so when I'm writing, I mean, I, yes, I'm certainly aware of the of the you know the mistakes that that have been made here in the past. But but I just don't think that you can you can take just one mistake and let that label a uh, label a, a people. You know, that's like saying you know. New York is bad because the mafia came from there. You can't do that, you know. So what I focus on is the the good parts of of small towns and 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 rural living, and you know the the part about community and 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 love and and faith and all of that. And and I, because that's the part that means the most to me. And I mean, I, I love the fact that that people can write, you know, anthems for a generation. I don't. I don't. I don't feel like that's part of my calling. With me, it's more about the voice of individuals who who basically just live their life, you know, going to work and taking care of their family and, and loving their community and and, uh, and 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 happy with what they have. Yeah, and, and I just want to clarify, I'm Southern through and through. There's a reason I, I'm on the same latitude as Birmingham, but um, I think for me, it's also reckoning with my own soul and recognizing I have a part in all of, yeah, I'm just a little person, but I have a part in all of it and trying to tell sort of um, the truths as they emerge. And and it's cool that we as songwriters get to choose, you know, what, what is the yeah. what we want to write? I mean, cause you might want to write about uh, you know, farming or you might want to write about the inner city and you get to decide. And, and for me, I'm just saying I have to write honestly and not pretend. And if I didn't, uh, and I could, you know, if I didn't, it would be an escape for me not to notice that that song is trying to get written, written like Michelle, like you said, the songs are trying to get, I think they're kind of trying to get written. And sometimes it's just listening. And um, like I say, I mean, the, there's certainly not, um, there's beauty, enormous beauty in everything about, about, you know, what, about the South. There's so much beauty. But my personal experience, I was I, I am partly defined by the fact that I grew up in the 60s and, and saw uh, what was supposed to be a riot. It really was quite peaceful, actually. Um, but uh, the the um, those things, I think COVID, it comes back to the virus, like what we started tonight. It's kind mm -hmm. of like it's bringing us full circle. We don't know when we're going to be out there being busy again and forgetting about these things that are so deep to us that we have a an inescapable chance to to reckon with what's really important. You know, maybe you'll like for you, it might be one thing for me. It might be for another writer. It might be a different thing. Um, it's, it's a, it's an unwanted blessing. We've got a lot of unwanted bl blessings right now, I think. And that's one of them. It's a chance to do that. So, uh, so for some things outside of the, the music and the writing in that, what is something that is an old passion of yours that kind of, uh, reignites uh, what you do outside of writing. Um, something that maybe you know you you have fun doing and getting away from the writing to kind of rebuild that that engine, you know, um, and take it into the shop and say it's recharged. And what's something that's old and that you're passionate about that maybe someone may never know, but never knew that's what you do to you know kind of recharge and reignite, um, Louisa. Um. You know, for me, um, I, I like my hands in the dirt. I like walking on my farm. I like um, seeing, repainting the fences. I'm really excited about it. Um, mm -hmm. And I think it's just, it's really just having my feet on the ground and, and feeling the, the years and years and years of, of surviving that's been done on that old cotton farm I live on. And the Trail of Tears went through there. And so human suffering Look, it's, I don't get to have the corner on the market on human suffering. And I, you know, sometimes I just have to like remember um, we're all walking each other home. We're all part of one story. And, and so there's some suffering up right now. But realizing, you know, there's redemption and, and recognizing, you know, this has been going on for a long, long time. These cycles of redemption and survival and grace, you know, they've been, it's been going, the story we're in right now, it's been going on a long time. It's just, this one's so big, it's hard not to pay attention. <laughs> right, exactly, exactly. And Daryl, how about for you? You know, I, I was always a history, you know, buff and always enjoyed reading and studying and, 
So when I'm on the road, obviously it's a lot easier. I don't get to do it as much now, but you know, I, I, I love to hunt down antique stores. I love going through them and, 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 you know, I, I, I'm especially fond of anything from between about the end of World War II up until the Kennedy assassination, you know, 40s, late 40s, 50s, um, and, and just searching out that stuff. And, and I've learned so much. Um, you know, the generation we live in now, is, it's fairly disposable. People don't save things and fix things. You know, it's a different world now. And um, I just that it keeps me in touch with the past. Mm -hmm. And that's important to me. Oh, that's, so, that's, um, you know, I'm just curious, Carol, what, what's something that you found from that era that's especially meaningful to you? Like what, um, that's such a cool idea. What, what symbolizes? Uh, you what, know, one of the things I started doing a few years ago was trying to learn how to do things the way, the way men used to do it, you know, and, and, and so I, I got really interested in, and razors, safety razors, uh, um, uh, straight blades, that sort of thing. And but after my dad passed away, my mom gave me his army kit, uh, just a bag he brought home from the army. And I actually found in that kit an unopened pack of razor blades. So they were brand new and they were 60 years old at the same time, you know. And so now uh, on on special days. Um, I'll take one of those blades out and, and shave with it. And it's just kind of a connection to him and, and to the past and all of that. It's just kind of a little little personal tribute. I don't talk about it a lot, but I do that. Well, that's pretty that's cool. Super cool. And to think that, that uh, at one time that blade was the cutting edge. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it was. And that was the interesting part to me is that it was, it was new and it was old at the same time. Yeah. Yeah. I love that. Yeah, I so, love it a lot. So as Daryl, you know, you kind of brought up something like thinking about like your dad and that let's think about, you know, being a kid again. I mean, could you could you imagine, you know, being a kid now? I mean, obviously, we all have someone in our life that's, you know, under the age of 18 or let's go even 15. Um, and but could you imagine like being that kid in what's going on today? No, I don't think so. I mean, I'm glad that I missed it, to be honest with you. You know, when I look at the way my parents were raised, it was not that much different than the way I was raised. You know, I was raised in a house with one television, you know, you know, with three channels, you know. And if the president was on, your night was shot because he was on every channel, you know. And, you know, we had one telephone nailed to the wall and, you know, just kind of like my parents did. But then my children's generation comes along and the way they do everything is different. The, the, the way they communicate. And the way they communicate changes every 18 months. You know, they go from one social media platform to the newest, you know, hot thing. And and so everything is different. You know, you, you'll see and you see it everywhere. A group of young people hanging out together, each one isolated into their phone. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm totally glad that I missed all of that. Um, I, I'm afraid. I mean, I love social media and I love the tool that it is. Um, I don't I think we're we don't yet know uh, the impact it's making on a generation. We'll look back on this and see. Do you, do you feel like in some aspects that this, you know, virus, it hit pretty much probably when everybody was absorbed in the new outlet of media, uh, social medias um, from TikTok, Instagram, Snapchat, um, you know, all that. And it came a stop you know kind of said all right it's time to revisit each other and get to know each other a little bit more and you know especially your your family that you're you live with or the friends that you live with and and things like that How, do you think that this was kind of like let's wake up you know and yeah. you know reconnect and rediscover once again it's a reconnect rediscover and reimagine what you can be doing as we move forward, as we stick together and go forward in, in this time as, you know, artists, songwriters, um, musicians, and, you know, everyone. I think this is a, a time where I think folks are realizing there's more out there, but at the same time, we want to bring what we've had into what we have now rediscovered. Yeah, you and know. I hope so. I, I hope I that's true. About, excuse me. Yeah, like, um, you know, like a tragedy always helps. It, 
you know, you, when you have a near miss, like on the highway or something, and for a flash, you think about your life for a flash, you reconnect with what's really important. Well, I might have, or like when I got the, the diagnosis that turned out to be uh, incorrect, um, you know, for a flash, well, so here's what's going on now. The flash is just extended. Every day we wake up and for a second, maybe we get to think this isn't happening, but the, you can't do anything without knowing it's happening, right? I can't go to the store, can't do this, can't do that. And so I think what you're saying, Michelle, is so true. It's like a reckoning. It's like a reckoning you can't avoid. Now, here's the thing. I think, okay, in five years, I might have been the age or the, finally at a point where I wanted to really have an end, ending long chapter, keyword long, and think about my life, you know, and think about what what I've done and, and what is there yet to do, but also just accept I've done enough, maybe, and that the last um, chapter is about whatever I wanted it to be, maybe connections for me and some writing. And, and, but I think that that usually only happens in a split second, like when you have a, a, a near miss, like a crisis. And this is, ha is requiring everyone to sort and face things in an ongoing way. Now I'm older, so I'm, I'm closer to that age where you're like thinking about your life, but what, what is that like for someone who's 15 or 30 or 40 to be yeah. thrown into what we usually do when we're 75? You know, what is that like for people to wrestle with such big questions when developmentally that's not usually what we're wrestling with? I don't know what that's like. Like, what's that like for you, Michelle? I know you're somewhat younger than me, so. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm going to be honest. Um, I you know, know I just your hairstyle, you're younger than me, but I've <laughs> <laughs> Well, I just turned 43 on Saturday. So, oh, yeah. No, um, but, but, yeah. But I will say um, this coming December will be five years since I lost a brother. And he passed away at 46. And, you know, even when that happened and you think it's like, that is like around the corner, you know? Yeah. Um, and my mom passed away just six months later at the age of 75. Um, so it, it makes, it. I, if, if, if obviously anybody who follows me on social media, I'm about living life, you know? I, I try, I've, I've gotten to the point, I have had some things that have happened in my life where it's like, you know what, I'm going to say what I, I mean, whether you like it or not, I really don't care because if I don't say it, you won't know how I feel. And also I'm going to live each day as if it is my last, you know, I mean, I was in a car accident last year and, you know, at, at that moment, all, all I could think and, you know, be very thankful that God did not there was no traffic coming from the other way. It happened right in front of the radio station, which is one of the very busy routes in our county and of semis and they fly speed limit 65 and and 55 in a certain area. And the fact that, you know, at any given time, there could be a semi coming full steam ahead. But at that moment, we literally, there was no traffic coming at us when we were doing three, three sixties. And it was like, I'm just very grateful and makes things back in perspective. And, you know, now in, in my personal, my personal life and in my relationships, I'll be like, I'm saying something you could take it with, you know, all hearts, or you could hate the fact that I was being honest with you, but you know what, we may not have that next chance to say it or do well, it, you know, and, and I think, you know, that's that's, you know, something very powerful for people to realize, especially when they have, you know, when you do lose someone um, and your age is getting there, you know, and that and it just makes you wonder, you know, what what would happen if it happened to me today? You know, mm -hmm. and I know a lot of you don't want to what ifs. So don't what if just live, you mm -hmm. know, um, if you want to be a songwriter or want to try attempt to be write, writing a song. Well, write it down, grab that book, grab that notebook and just start writing. You never know what's going to happen. I mean, for me, during times like this, um, these last few months, I went back to my love of painting, you know, and whether it's my painting of my trees and that to me is the most expression. And I've been doing that since I was in high school and, you know, and I draw raw trees where it's just 
the bark and just the the branches. I don't draw, you know, fluffy, puffy, happy trees. They're they have emotions. Every stroke, every branch is emotion. And I think what whatever you have and whatever you've done that helps you get through or you know get in touch with your feelings. This is this is the time to do it. And um, you know, I think as you know, you remove re move we move forward. Um, I think it's important that you find something, whether it's something in the past or something brand new, you know, I mean, think about it, like folks who are, are tuning in and thinking, well, you know what, maybe I'll try my hand at songwriting. Well, why not? Right. I mean, yeah. nobody says you can't do it. Well, unless I, mean, you try. I mean, I just, uh, when, when we get talking about songwriting, this thing happens where I start thinking in hooks and, and really, Really, you if you took that experience about the, the three three sixty turns, you know, and, and you made that a song, you know, because I'm, I'm thinking like my, you know, three I see three hundred and sixty degrees now, so don't mess with me. I'm going to talk about <laughs> the whole thing, you know. But the other thing I like about what you just said, and so so just to underscore that for a second. If you take any experience and figure out what it was about. Try for five words, there's a longer title. Then you have yeah. submitted your song. But even if you don't write the song, you found out what was important, right? Right. But, but the other thing I like about what you said is like live as if it's not, I mean, live, live anyway, live in all of anyway, or of anyway. But yeah, I love how you said that. Like, kind of like live as if the sky is not falling. I don't know, I've been able to do that. Can you do that, Daryl? Like, live as if. I mean, Michelle's just really good at that. <laughs> I guess I guess I kind of do. You know, uh, mm -hmm. most of the songs that I write are really about how life used to be or might be, could have been, you know, uh, heavy on nostalgia because that's kind of my happy place. You know, it's mm -hmm. it's the, the whole May, Mayberry idea. Um, too much of current events uh, stresses me out, you know, I, because you know, it's like a bunch of fleas arguing about what the dog's going to do. You know, the dog's going to do what it does. Right. You know, so I'm, I'm, I don't, I try not to get caught up too much in that. I'm, you know, there's so much about life that's still really good. Uh, and to, you know, today is a good day because you're still here and you mm -hmm. still have the opportunity to, to change things or uh, be a different person, be a better person, reach out to somebody, you know, be good to somebody. Uh, you still got that opportunity today. You know, I don't know if you'll have that tomorrow or if I will. Uh, mm -hmm. So just be a good steward of the day. I don't, I don't spend a lot of time. The, I guess the only time I think about uh, the sky falling necessarily is just trying to, to create a legacy of, of relationships and, and, and a body of work and stuff that, that represents who, how I want to be remembered. Right. 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 No, I think it gets to the point that we can build who we are, like the whole song. We can build who we are. We can create. We still have so much free choice. And, yeah. and uh, you know, like I, since I think because I, I was raised during civil rights and and then um, other human rights movements, I, you know, like it's hard for me not to think about what's happening in the world. But I also am programmed to look for hope. So. I, I might have a day where I don't have an image of hope, but I think if you can just look like, look forward to one thing every day, that's probably good enough. If I can look forward to one thing, and if I don't have something, fi figure out what something, you know, create mm -hmm. something to look forward to. So I know um, you both have to have some funny stories, whether it's uh, from workshops that you've um, been part of, or uh, on the road, or even in songwriting sessions with your co-writers, I, I want I want you guys to spill some of the, a funny story that you could think of um, that comes to your mind right now that you'd love to share with us and and you know lighten up the uh, the evening and, and that and make somebody laugh a little bit. I think putting a smile on somebody's face about a funny story is always a good way to do it, right? So well, you know, I traveled with Bobby. And, I traveled with Bobby and Sonny Osborne for a few years, uh, and and that was a wealth of funny story material. Um, but it wasn't so much the, necessarily the things that happened with us, but uh, lots of times it was uh, stories to hear them tell them. And one of my all-time favorite funny stories was this is a story Bobby Osborne told me, 
And if you ever get around Bobby, get him to tell it because it's way better when Bobby tells it. But when, when Bobby and Sonny were on the road back in the 60s, they were recording for MCA Records, which was a, a country label in Nashville, and they were doing a lot of the package shows. And, and so, you know, they were on the same label with Conway Twitty and Loretta Lynn and you know, all these big country acts. And Sonny said, you know, we would be on these package shows and then we'd get on stage and we'd gather around a microphone and you couldn't hear us because they were used to all the electric guitars and the, and the drums and everything. So that's why Bobby and Sonny decided to go electric with their instruments. And so Bobby said the very first night they were at the Ryman Auditorium playing the Grand Ole Opry, he had, Bobby had told the sound tech to just lay a little quarter inch cord over by the microphone. And so Bobby walks out there and very, you know, unassumingly plugs that, get that, that mandolin in. Uh, so now it's electric. Well, Mr. Monroe, Bill Monroe is standing in the wings when all this is going on, and Bill doesn't see the cord. All he hears is Bobby chop down on that mandolin, and Bobby said it just blew the back wall out of the rhyme, and he said it was so loud. And, and he said, we played, and, and, and the mandolin is just roaring. It sounds so great. And Monroe is standing off to the side. And he said, as I'm coming off stage, Bill catches him, and he says, oh, oh, what kind of mandolin you got out there? And he said, well, Bill, it's, it's just like yours. Bill said, I ain't no metal that I ever heard could do what yours just did. <laughs> he didn't laugh because he just didn't let him know that it was plugged in. It was so funny. I love to hear Bobby tell that. Oh, wow. That's great. Um, well, let's see what's funny. Oh, gosh, lots of funny things from, from being on the road when we were in our 20s. But um you know, the time maybe I told Mel Tillis I didn't want to meet at 8.30 to start singing songs for him. I'd really rather wait till 9.30 in the morning. And <laughs> you know, oh, boy. Yeah, he put me in my place. I just was too young and stupid to to know that, you know, you just don't tell the person who's been male vocalist of the year five years in a row that that's too early. And uh, so I did go in there, and, and he put his feet up and, and drank coffee and, and listened for uh, a long, long time. And and it was it was fantastic, but I remember the time that we uh, pulled off the ramp on the way to some gig when we opened the door, sliding door of the van, and we were opening it to, to change drivers, and three hippies jumped in. I mean, and we had to like figure out how to get them back out of the van because they were hitchhiking. And uh, <laughs> then the time we were going to a oh okay, I'll tell this one on Lester Flat. We were at a Martha White festival, and I think it was. I don't know if it was Myrtle Beach. It was somewhere over there on the coast. And uh, Lester, you know, I think I've mentioned, I, just, I, I couldn't talk in those days. I couldn't even, I just tried to hide a lot. I was so self-conscious in my 20s. And, um, but I didn't think Lester knew who I was from Adam. And he was at the other end of this big, long plaza, like in a hotel, you know, a big thing in the middle of the hotel, long sidewalks. He's way at that end, and I'm way at this end. And as he was approaching me, he said, and he started this sentence, there's that banjo picking girl. And by the time he finished that one sentence, like we were totally all the way at the other ends of the whole. <laughs> <laughs> but your story about Bill Monroe reminded me of, uh, of, a, of a time that uh, we played a, a, like a disco kind of a thing. And when we got in there, we were opening from Monroe and I thought, oh, he will not play in here. There is no way he's gonna play in here with this disco ball and all these drugged out people and they're playing loud rock when we were setting up. And he came in after us and he had on his white suit and he came out under those blue lights. He ate it up, man. And he just, he loved it. And he went, he did his regular show, except for he was like smiling even more than usual. and I. I think I learned a lot from that about, you know, his versatility and his showmanship. And that's, you know, that's what bluegrass is. I mean, that's, you know, we, we play, <laughs> that's what we do. Yeah. <laughs> you know, so show. many people have, have Bill Monroe stories or tell them I've only got one Monroe story that actually happened to me. And when I was about 18 years old on a Friday night, I snuck backstage at the Opry uh, cause I'd never been there. And I'm, I'm I wasn't so obviously I wasn't supposed to be there. So I'm kind of trying to hide out before the Opry started. And then I thought I could just mingle in with everybody, you know, and, and I didn't know where I was going. I walked around the corner and physically ran into Bill Monroe. I mean, collided. And he just, you know, he was just this stoic and you know, he just stopped. And I mean, I'm just a kid. And so I just started spilling my guts, Miss Monroe, I'm sorry. I, I'm not supposed to, you know, I snuck backstage. I just, you know, con confessing everything. And he said, are you not supposed to be here? 
I said, no, sir, I'm not. He said, you come with me. I'm thinking, great, I'm going to get arrested or kicked out of the Opry. And, but he, he, he takes me through the hallway, and he brings me right to the stage and shows me where the, the, the benches are, that right behind where the band plays at the Opry. And he said, you have a seat right here, and if anybody asks, you tell them you are a special guest of Bill Monroe. Oh, that's wow. awesome. And I sat there and watched, and I sat there all night long and watched the Opry. That is cool. That, that's that is how cool. I remember him. Yeah. So is is there a particular festival um, that each of you have performed or even a venue that stands out in your career that, you know, you're so thankful for, for playing outside of playing on the Opry or playing at the Ryman? Um, Louisa, is there somewhere that, you know, just stands out in the memory of in your career this far? Um, special venues. What a great question. I've never heard that question. Uh, you know, I, I, I won a statewide original contest to write a classical piece and had to play with the Birmingham Symphony at the Birmingham Civic Auditorium when I was 11. That was pretty horrible and uh, memorable. And then, um, you know, Bluegrass Wives, I think Buddy's Barbecue in Knoxville, Tennessee was a huge phenomenon in the uh, 70s and 80s. And we got to, you know, follow, uh, we just had a circuit, you know, back in those days. And, uh, you know, so Claire played there a lot. And um, I think she might have, I don't know, she, I can't quote for Claire. I think she might have written the song about the day that Lester died. She might have been there. But, um, but you know, we had the Knoxville grass. It was just so formative and and you know, in our in my career with Buddy Bar Buddy's Barbecue, and then also the the festivals during that time, Pilot Mountain was great. Um, I'm thinking there's probably others, but uh, those are the ones that you know right off the top of my head. Right, right. How about for you, Daryl? You know, there's been there's so many that are just high water marks. You know, I've I've enjoyed the the time playing the Bluebird. You know, just because of so many great writers who've come through that place. Um, but I had the opportunity when I was on the road with Bobby and Sonny, we did a, a concert at West Point Military Academy. Sure. And that was pretty incredible to to be there with all the history and actually get a chance to to perform for the cadets. And that was that was that was one that I'll never forget. You know, it's, it's interesting because I, I think I remember those things, Michelle, in terms of the, the personal memories, because I just was thinking, I, I don't remember this, but I kind of do. But Allison Brown had pointed out to me a while back that uh, my band Boot Hill with Sam Sanger and Steve Block and Gary Brown, we played at a library for her 10th birthday. And what? I, I think we I think her parents hired us to play somewhere for, I, I believe, a library for or somewhere for her for a birthday party when she was a kid. So I, I'm I just, and she has told me that she remember, you know, for her to see a woman playing banjo at that, right. at that point in her life. Um, you know, and uh, uh, I, I mean, I remember a festival where Buck White kind of took me under his wing. So I just think this whole conversation, Daryl, like what you said with Monroe is making me think how important those moments are with people where we the takeaway is like a lifelong thing and it's just maybe five minutes maybe it's 10 minutes and you know what what am i doing that either helps or hinders that process and this stuff going on doesn't stop us from doing that you know? no i think yeah. that's why it's so important just to be good to people you know because you never know when that five minutes might make such a huge difference you know that i mean i, I know you get it i still get it people come up to me that that met me 20 years ago at some festival and they remembered that they remember what we sang and they remembered the songs and you know this was a huge moment for them that that i may or might not even recall you know but at least if i was nice to people you know i was good to them then it's there's no you know there's nothing about it that i wouldn't want to look back on no oh, that's so true you know it's so easy to forget in the day in, day out of it all, that what we're doing might be making a difference, either good or bad for someone, you know? And uh, I remember I, I, after I had to quit temporarily to go back to school and just play regionally instead of nationally, I kept playing, but I went to this festival and, um, oh, Alison Krauss pulled up in the black, but on the front of it, it said, nobody, you know, and this was like in the, in the eighties, early eighties. And of course, everybody already did know her, but, I sat down and I felt like an invisible, I was grieving so much playing on the road. And I felt like I had lost my sense of place in the world. I didn't realize how much bluegrass 
after that for 15 years, it was just my family. And I sat down on, you know, and on this like, I don't know, 12th row or 25th row. And I'm just sitting there going, gosh, you know, wish I still, <laughs> you know, where do I fit in now? And, and um, just missing it all. And this yeah. woman tapped me on the shoulder and she said, did you used to be Louisa Branscombe? <laughs> 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 I feel like so because I don't think I feel like her now. <laughs> That's funny. So before we we kind of get things wrapping up uh, on this Thursday with Real Talk Bluegrass, uh, I want to make sure everybody knows where where they can follow you guys at. Of course, LouisaBranscombe.com. Um, you got to check out her website. Got a lot of great music. Her latest album, Gonna Love Anyway, with Compass Records. Uh, Dara Mosley, Pine Castle Records artist, um, The Secret of Life is your brand new album um, that was just released as well. And, you know, both of these albums are just spectacular and in, in, in just seeing this, it, the music involved in, in, in Embrace. So folks need to check out DarylMosley.com, LouisaBranscom.com. Uh, follow them on their social media pages. Stay connected. Get them digitally download if you're on uh, digitally uh, downloading your music. Uh, do that as well. Uh, um, and, uh, before I... Before we officially wrap up, I, I have another question. I'm going back a little bit into the music and the fact that you both just released amazing albums um, and, you know, talented songwriters. Um, you both have received, you know, awards for what you do. And we truly appreciate you sharing your gift with all of us. And, you know, going back to like the beginning of your career and now looking at music and how you, it in, involved how it's involved in how, what, what can you, what can you each say individually on how your music from the beginning to this current album that each of you have put out kind of like, you know, involved for you, Daryl. Um, I think it, obviously in the early days, I was still trying to figure out what a good song was and how to craft one. And, um, and obviously, I mean, that's still the primary objective is to write good songs. But but now more, like I said, it, I'm, I'm also really focused on, on like I said, writing a, a, a body of work that, that represents uh, life as I want it remembered. You know, uh, my, my, my personal story, the story of people that I know, you know, the title song of the new album is, it's about the the gentleman here that cuts my hair, you know, and and these are just these are these are people, and there's millions of them across our nation that are just salt of the earth people that that, that not, don't necessarily have a platform to tell these stories, and 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 so I, I just feel really compelled that that that's the that's the stories that those are the stories I want to tell, and you know I, I don't I mean I write a lot of gospel songs, um, I. You know, I try not to write anything that I that I'd be ashamed to sing at church anyway. You know, but uh, uh, but but songs that that just represent uh, life as I as I guess life as I want it to be. Mm -hmm. Maybe that's not necessarily the life as it always is, but life like I want it. I want to be remembered. Well, you know, I'm gonna I'm gonna touch a little base about uh, the secret of life because you know you think about the songs uh, like a few years ago. You know that. That song, it, when whether I'm in the car and it comes on my my playlist, or it's I'm in the studio and someone requests it, um, you know, it's it's. I do love the fact that you you love talking about the old days, you know, because it reminds me of the stories from you know my parents, my grandparents, and and that and what they you know have shared with us, and th that you know, even though it was difficult times then, it seems simple. You know, and yeah. I think that I think this whole album, The Secret of Life, you kind of grasp that. And, I, I, you know, that is a key thing. It kind of reminds you. Man, I, I remember, you know, I think about the days when I was a kid, you know, playing softball, playing basketball, going outside, playing football with my brothers. You know, I'm the youngest of 10. So it was like we had our built in teams, you know. And wow. um, so it 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 just kind of reminds me. It's like, man, that. That, that was simple times, you know, I didn't have to worry about things. I didn't have to, you know, didn't have to feel like a grown up. I sometimes I have to feel like I still don't have to be a grown up, but I am, you know, um, but because, you know, you think about those days and the simpler times and and the simple life. I certainly think there's a 
still, you know, still a, a huge need for that. You know, um, it's not it's not by accident that the Andy Griffith Show continues to be so hugely popular. You know right. that you know that classic movies are still played on television. There's still a longing in, in many of us to connect with a simpler time, uh, and maybe it's an escape from the time that we're living in, or maybe it's a way just to reconnect to a time that you remember. But I, I still think there's, especially now, there's a huge need for that. I was thinking about that. I was listening to um, Kenny and Amanda Smith's uh, Norman Rockwell World. You know, yeah. and yeah. it's the same. It's the same. Under, it's the same type of type of song, and. Uh, so yeah, I think there's a real market for that. There's a there's a connection that we need for that right now. So I'm I'm happy because that's what I write. Well, we, we again truly appreciate it. Now, Louisa, you know your career spans you know just a smidge but longer than you know Daryl's and mine. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, you know, how do you kind of look back at what you've wrote in the beginning to now and, you know, and what you've put out on Gonna Love Anyway? Um, I don't know. Uh, <clears throat> I just think that it's a, the, the journey is the same. The journey is just about trying to write the song that's the truest in that moment. And, um, <clears throat> you know, I, I think uh, Daryl and I are have some similar sensibilities, but also maybe uh, lean a little different stylistically. And like for me, I think I write fewer ballads and more about um, sort of humanity, um, images and ideas and, and you know, uh, things like Go Gonna Love Anyway or um, those kinds of songs. But I also think that this whole time is forcing us in, in 2020 to live more like it was in 1940 or 50 or 60. So, so it is bringing us back to what's simple. And I know one tried and true way to get away from the stress of all this out here around us is just hands-on things. So yeah. like it would be a song like My John Deere Tractor that's on the album. So I'm doing both. I want to write a message that is about humanity that may have some worth um, that's, but I, but not in a, not in a political or, or preachy way, but more through images. Right. And, um, and then, and then I also want to just sometimes just shed thinking altogether and just notice the concrete world, you know, the, the old board, the old boards on the chicken coop that I didn't paint the chicken coop. I just painted the whole farm, but I didn't paint the chicken coop. <laughs> the outhouse. I didn't paint the outhouse. Um, and, and you know, and look at the colors of the rust, the rust, the patina on the outhouse. And Daryl, we got to get together because I I've been collecting kitchen stuff from the 50s. So it's the, like I got the um, a pewter uh, where you grind your oranges. What do you call that? Yeah. And I got um, like the old, uh, remember that color they had in the in the 60s, like yellow ochre? Remember those, those colors from the 50s? Oh, yeah. Harvest gold and some of those. Yeah, yeah. yeah. That thing. I've got like these... Uh, a minute, like a mixer that's that color, and and uh, I gotta, I gotta, I gotta, I gotta show you those sometime. Oh, I'd love to see them. Yeah, that's that's yeah. right in my wheelhouse. Yeah, so, <laughs> you know, I'm thinking, you know, so I think that's a double answer, Michelle. It's like staying true to the to the meaning of what's going on with you, but also right. sometimes the song writes you. So it's just noticing what's important and write about that. But slowing down to see these concrete things around us, slowing down to think about the guy who cuts your hair, slowing down for me to notice, you know, the the, the tractor's getting rusty or, or whatever it is. You know, it's maybe there's something in the universe that said, y'all are not getting the message. You need to slow down and think about what's important and shook things up a little bit. And yeah. uh, so we either listen or we don't. Well, we're definitely going to be listening to some more great music uh, as, uh, again, encouraging folks to get uh, Gonna Love Anyway, Compass Records with Louisa Branscombe, louisabranscombe.com, Daryl Mosley, uh, Pine Castle Records, uh, a recording artist, and uh, uh, li uh, Life's uh, The Secret of Life um, with uh, his latest album there and darylmosley.com. Uh, thank you guys so much for, uh, you know, energizing another evening of great fun and inspiration for maybe those who are intrigued to uh, start writing or even just 
pondering life in a different way when they listen to songs. I think that's a key thing um, is because you can hear one song one way one day and another day it can be a totally different way you hear it. And, and it's all because the, it's uh, the inspiration that you've put into your art, your craft. And, you know, that's why you guys are award winning artists and songwriters. And we truly appreciate you uh, doing that continuously. Um, we hope you uh, both stay safe and well, um, and hopefully to see you guys on the road eventually as uh, hopefully everybody will be back in full force in 2021. Um, and maybe, maybe we'll uh, see you guys all through the virtual world of bluegrass uh, with IBMA come later on in, uh, in the next two months uh, as we find out more details on how that will unfold. But Daryl, Louisa, thank you so much for being on Real Talk. I hope you guys had as much fun as I did. Mm -hmm. I sure did. Great to see it you, Daryl. Michelle, thank you. I appreciate that. Louisa, I love you. Good to see you. You too. See y'all soon. All right. Thank you guys. Again, another wonderful Thursday with Real Talk Bluegrass. Our next episode is going to be July 30th. I have some of the guests lined up, but you'll have to wait to find out who those will be um, in due time. And have yourself a wonderful evening. Again, Real Talk Bluegrass. We got real. <laughs> Take care. <laughs>